Thank you for gathering. This is one of those things where people don't see each other very much anymore, so it's nice to have a gathering where you can actually see people's faces. I baptized the baby this morning. That child was not happy. I think there was teeth involved, some new teeth. I really didn't want to break it to her that there's going to be another set later. <laughs> but, uh, I think the little kids, it's going to surprise them in a year or two that everybody has whole faces they're just not used to seeing. So this will be our opening prayer. We used this last time. This is from the Feast of St. Thomas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O God, who made St. Thomas Aquinas outstanding in his zeal for holiness and his study of sacred doctrine, Grant us, we pray, that we may understand what he taught and imitate what he accomplished. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So thank you for coming this evening. Uh, there's some new faces, so I just want to wave if this is your first visit to us. There they are. Last time, we and we have some folks joining us virtually, I think, so... Uh, last time we just kind of did an overview of the life, the biography of Aquinas, where he kind of fits in history. And tonight I am going to realize your worst nightmare if you took philosophy in college. We are going to condense 2,500 years in maybe half an hour or so, and it will be agonizing. That's why I gave the handout at least so if you do drift off, you can sort of pretend later that you were paying attention. Some words you can pull out and use. So the purpose this evening, and this will be a little bit deep and heavy, I will grant you, but it is sort of to look at the pattern of thought in Western philosophy. What came first? Where does Aquinas fit in this progression of thinking? what followed St. Thomas, uh, particularly once we get to the um, Renaissance, Reformation, modern era, as it's called, and then into postmodern philosophy today. And you see it all around you, you read it in the headlines, you watch it on TV, we live in a postmodern world. And so that's kind of, I just want to situate things a little bit. Um, and if you feel like you're sinking and drowning, that's really okay. We'll, we have a defibrillator somewhere <laughs> in the building. So we want to start with a quiz. Uh, and you have this in front of you. Just take a few moments and see how well you can do. <laughs> you write it down, Joe. Don't, don't copy. More <laughs> time. I had to scour the internet. <laughs> okay, when was the War of 1812? Roughly, yes. Grant's tomb holds Jim Grant, the Washington Monument dedicated to George Washington. The Lincoln Memorial, anybody been there? For Abraham Lincoln. Color is the White House? That's good. See, it's not so hard. Philosophy is really fairly easy. How many people does a two person bike hold? Usually two. You can do more, but it's a problem. And the Minnesota History Center focuses on. Okay. So now we have the dreadful quiz. This is on your handouts. Uh, and we're going to be talking later on about these terms, but these are common philosophical terms. I wanted to sort of ease you into that a little bit with the easy quiz. Um, some of this will be familiar to you, some might be new, but just take your best shot at this. Ten philosophical terms that are helpful to read Aquinas and any uh, work of philosophy. In grade school, and you're bending with your head down.
if you buy the right kind of cereal and spend time at breakfast, these are all on the back of some cereal box, I'm sure. Maybe not hylomorphism. Are you done, Miriam? Almost. Almost. <laughs> this experience generates among scholars several responses like, is this on the test? Why do we have to know this? Who cares? Things like that. Those are common philosophical questions as well. So Kind of stop where you are. We'll come back to this and go through these in just a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about the Summa Theologiae. I brought along the first volume. This is the English translation. There's three volumes like this of the Summa Theologiae. And as you saw in the uh, uh, bibliography of Aquinas, this was kind of the culmination, the last work that he did. And as we said, he never actually finished. He had whatever that experience was, possibly a stroke, uh, when he was about 46 years old and stopped writing at that point, right when he was talking about the sacrament of penance. The last section of the Summa is called the Supplement, which was put together by his students and, and peers from lecture notes and other things Aquinas had written. It just doesn't have the same uh, quality and zing as Aquinas' original work. The plan of the Summa overall is known as Exodus of Redditus, uh, going forth and a coming back. And so I've just outlined here what the Summa covers in, in this kind of order. It starts with God. Well, actually, it starts with uh, theology as a science. And as he says, he wrote this Summa for beginners in theology. I wanted to start right at the very beginning. And then goes into God, the existence of God, and we'll talk about this next time. Uh, how do we know that God exists and the attributes of God? Aquinas was, um, of course, bringing together traditions from uh, prior to him. There's really two ways that we can talk about theology, and the uh, fathers of the church talked about cataphatic and antiphatic theology. In other words, what we know positively of God but Aquinas would agree it is more that we don't know about God. So we kind of reason our way backwards. And when you think of the attributes of God, many of them are really negative attributes. For instance, God is immortal, means he doesn't die. God is immutable, means he doesn't change. God is eternal, means he's not in time. And so there's a lot of that kind of language we think of it in positive ways, but it's really about things God isn't. We'll come back to uh, then he talks about creation, the, the Genesis account of creation. Again, Aquinas learned much of his science, if you will, from Aristotle. And so the medieval philosophers, theologians, were limited by science of their day, the science they inherited. They didn't have all the apparatus um, and the accumulation of our knowledge that we did but their reasoning remains solid. I did a paper for Father Ashley once that said if Aquinas had known 
what we know about embryology, he would have argued for ensoulment immediately rather than at 40 days. Father Ashley was mildly convinced and gave, gave me an A minus on <laughs> I think he missed the key point. Anyway, um, <laughs> then he goes into the human person and at great, great length, most of the Summa is about the person, particularly the soul, the intellect, how we know things, and then um, about the moral life, natural law, and the vast majority of Aquinas' writings about the virtues, virtues and vices, those habits. Uh, and then um, he goes into Christology and the sacraments. So as things come forth from God, they in Christ are redeemed and then returned to God until Jesus returns at the last day. And as Paul says, all is in all in Christ. So that's kind of the pattern of the Summa, going out from God, coming back to God. I can't do that, I gotta do this. I want to say just a word. So when you read, if you read the Summa, you'll come across several people who appear over and over again. Aquinas uses the arguments of his day and the philosophers with whom he agrees and those with whom he disagrees. Um, and there's several figures that appear over and over. He had a great love for St. Augustine and um, respect for Augustine's writing. So much so that when even he disagreed strenuously with Augustine, he would say things like, Augustine said it was black. What he really meant to say was white, um, for instance. So uh, we'll see where Augustine in Aquinas' mind was misled. But again, he didn't have all of the tools that Aquinas did uh, about eight centuries later. When he mentions the philosopher, not by name, but just that title, it's Aristotle. For him, Aristotle was the philosopher. Plato, he had some acknowledgement of, but he had a lot of problems with Plato's philosophy, and we'll see why. The commentator was Averroes. Remember that uh, Aquinas did not speak Greek or, uh, or Hebrew. And so his knowledge of Aristotle, who wrote in Greek, of course, came through the Islamic philosophers who had translated Aristotle's Greek into Latin. And that's how the medievals came to know of Aristotle's philosophy, along with commentary that the Islamic philosophers had done. And Aquinas was a critical reader of Aristotle and of Averroes. But he used, um, referred to Averroes a lot, especially when we're talking about the soul. He called him the commentator. The apostle is always St. Paul. Okay, so those are names you'll see if you read the Summa. What do we, when we talk about philosophy, philosophy has a number of branches, different ways to think about what we know and the world around us. Physics is the physical world. Um, when I was at St. Cloud State, the biology lab was right below the physics lab. And the first week of school, you hear this think, 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 think. They're dropping marbles and uh, measuring them and how often they bounce. And uh, our professor said, that's the physics department proving that the law of gravity still works. <laughs> <laughs> so physics is what we know of physics. And again, we know a lot more about um, atoms and um, quarks and protons and neutrons and electrons and neutrinos and all those things that they did not know about, but the same basic observation and the scientific method. We have a theory, we experiment, we confirm or deny the hypothesis. Metaphysics is about things that go beyond physics, the, the underlying realities around the physical world being, change, becoming, unity, plurality, all of those kinds of things. And the interesting thing about the metaphysics, of, Aristotle called it the metaphysics because on the shelf, if you arrange the books that he wrote, the metaphysics comes right after the books of the physics. And so metaphysics just means after physics. 
It also has that deeper meaning, of course, it's bigger than physics. Epistemology is how we know human knowledge, how it works, what do we know, what do we not know, uh, why do people have different kinds of knowledge, all those kinds of things. Morality, of course, is what is right and wrong in human behavior. Philosophy took a turn, and Aquinas does some of this, uh, Aristotle did some of this, linguistics, how we use language. What words mean? Where do words come from? What do they reveal? What do they conceal about reality? How does language fall short of trying to convey certain things or ideas adequately? You'll have this distinction you'll often read about between empiricism and rationalism. Empirical thought is based on observation. I use my senses, I look at the world around me, and I, I have an empirical experience. So we'll talk sometimes in science about empirical research, which is basically just counting things, measuring things, uh, seeing the world around us. Empiricism is what we all do. What you're doing right now is listening, writing, those kinds of things around us. Rationalism has to do with the ratio or the reason or the mind. And we'll see why this is important in a little while. The empiricists would say the only things are true is what we can observe in the world around us. The rationalists, and Plato had some piece of this, was the real things are what is in your mind. And the things that you encounter might give you some clues, but sometimes they are more of an obstacle than a help toward knowledge. So empiricism, rationalism. And then realism and nominalism. Uh, the question of what is real? What is ultimately real, true, existing, and how do we know it? We'll talk about William of Ockham and the nominalists um, in just a little bit here. I keep making all these promises. I hope I can keep them. Uh, so this is a quote that um, from Kelvin and Hobbes. That uh, is often attributed to Augustine. Love the sinner, but hate the sin. And his dad comes out of the car and says, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Read Calvin Hobbes. He's a great philosopher. I once did a whole um, talk on Calvin and Hobbes and all the different schools of moral thinking, because he illustrates all of them. Plato said, philosophy begins in wonder, question. Fundamental human question is why? Why? Your dog, your cat, your fern plants just kind of exist. They don't ponder deeply about the, the world around them. If you feed them, they're happy. If they're hungry, they'll uh, look for food or bark or meow or whatever they do. So here is my thesis. This is just mine, but I think it's fairly grounded in the history of philosophy. All philosophical thought revolves around three basic questions. What is real? And how do we know what is real? Second, how much control do we have over this reality? And what is the meaning, purpose, or goal of human existence? So I call these three mainstreams the search for truth, freedom, fulfillment. Okay. So keep that in mind. The classic philosophers, the pre-modern philosophers, pre-Socratics through the Middle Ages, focused on the objective for the most part. What we experience in the world outside of us. So truth becomes our knowledge of the divinely ordered, objective order of things. Reality as we experience it. And when I say divinely established, this isn't just Christian faith or theism. Uh, Aristotle and Plato also had this belief that there was some God, not, not the Christian God or the God of Revelation, as we understand it, but some higher being that was the cause and the purpose of all things. So truth, sometimes it's called the correspondence theory of truth. What's in my mind, my ideas match what is out there, outside of me. Freedom is the liberty to choose to conform our lives to that objective order of things. That we have, we're not bound to a certain way of being 
you plant uh, a tree, it always grows up. It doesn't say, you know, everybody else is doing that. I want to do something different. I think I'll go down. They, you drop a rock, it doesn't say, all oh, these conformist rocks go down. I'm going this way. They follow natural order of things. Humans also have a nature, but our nature includes freedom. And so we can choose a path. We're not bound to a particular certain way of doing things. And fulfillment then is what's the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? Happiness, eudaimonia as uh, Aristotle called it, um, to have a good spirit, a happy spirit. Happiness in a life of virtue. Plato says virtue is its own reward. Why should I be good? Because it's good to be good. It makes you most like the true good the ideal good. And so conforming our lives to the good, the true, we would say from a Christian point of view, holiness is the purpose of life, to live in accord with our nature. And for us, of course, we believe that results in eternal life. Well, come, I'm just doing this real quick uh, overview of these three major periods of philosophy. Then we'll go back through and slavishly look at some of the philosophers. So modernity, uh, dated different ways, often thought to begin with Descartes, René Descartes. We'll come back to Descartes. You know Descartes from uh, geometry in high school. The Cartesian coordinate system, where you map X and Y and points and lines and all that, that's Descartes. He was a mathematician and a philosopher. And the story is that he was kind of a lazy mathematician. So he came up with the idea of graphing the Cartesian coordinate system by watching a fly one morning. He didn't want to get out of bed, so he watched the fly crawl across the ceiling. I can make a vector out of that. That's where the idea came from. So staying in bed is not such a bad idea. <laughs> Modernity then somewhat changed the way these three things, these three themes are thought of. Truth now is still the objective order of the universe, but as we know it through science, as we know it by measurement, by experiment, by the quantifiable realities around us. Mathematical certitude is what we're looking for. And remember, this is the time when you have Newton and Copernicus and a lot of discoveries, we'll come back to that, in physics, in science, um, in chemistry, in biology, just the explorations are happening. And so they're encountering different parts of the world that were not known to them. And science and mathematics seem to be the clearest way to have absolute certitude. This goes back to the time of Pythagoras. Remember the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Pythagoras was a mathematician and a musician. Pythagoras discovered that this uh, frequency of vibrations and notes have a harmonious pattern. And if they're not proper multiples, then you get this discord. And so they were just fascinated by the objective order being measurable and predictable by mathematics. Freedom then became autonomy. That we, the more that we know about the natural world, the more control we will have over it. And that we have the freedom to make an ideal world using science and technology. The more that we accumulate of knowledge, the more that we contribute to this um, treasury of our understanding of the world, the less subject we will be to these forces beyond our control. And you can see where religion and faith get a little bit stressed in this sort of change of worldviews. And we'll also not just discover the universal laws of matter, we'll also discover universal laws of morality, how people ought to behave. And of course, once we know what we ought to do, everybody's going to do it. It's just so obvious. <laughs> and then fulfillment becomes the idea was called meliorism. From the Latin melior, which means better. Things are just going to keep getting better and better and better, and we will create a perfect world here through human effort. 
We just have to try harder, invest more, have uh, better use of the world's resources and technology and science. There will be this inevitable in crescendoing improvement in the human condition towards utopia, which literally means nowhere. Utopia means it's not anywhere, at least not yet. And history has shown, of course, that these ideas, they're beautiful ideas, but they don't work always the way we expect. They're overly optimistic, they're incomplete. And thus, that sets the stage. Things like uh, religious persecution, wars that last for decades or the Hundred Years' War, um, the ability to use science and technology not only to build, but also to destroy. Benedict said in Space All Day's Encyclical and Hope that he quotes one of the postmodern philosophers, Theodore Adorno, and says, Tech progress means from the slingshot to the atom bomb. So that we're able to do great, much greater destruction. And you know the history of Nazi Germany, how um, very organized, ordered, scientific was their ability to destroy and to kill and to exterminate the extreme uh, misapplication of science. And this is the world that the postmoderns discover. Postmodernity, it was a great thing to write about. I wrote uh, part of my dissertation on postmodernity, which was perfect because nobody knows what it is. They couldn't ask me any questions that had any right answers. Um, even postmodern philosophers disagree about what it is. Does it have a definition? Is it one thing? Is it many things? So postmodernity is about, it turns toward the subjective. Remember, modernity and pre-modernity is about the outside world, the objective and measuring it and understanding it. Postmodernity tends to turn inward to the subject, to the individual, um, to skepticism about truth. Nobody knows for sure. You, might, you can have your truth, I have my truth. Um, and you can't judge me and I can't judge you. Relativism, as it's called. Whatever you want to believe that the truth in itself is simply unknowable to us, undecidable. And the criterion for truth is really what works, what's pragmatically effective, what's where I live, what culture I live in, uh, what era I live in. And truth is fluid, flexible, changeable. Freedom is individual liberty. The law of gravity sort of still constrains us, but you think about all the changes in our social structures in maybe the last 20, 30, 5, 10 years, or whatever time frame you want. All these things we sort of thought everybody knew are coming more and more into question. Even the, the question, how many genders? Are there? I don't know, we're up to now on Facebook, like 72 different genders that you could be. Uh, when I was growing up, you were a man or a woman. That was kind of the worldview that everybody shared. We don't share that any longer. Um, and so the, the freedom is about making your own life project, who you want to be. And that's very fluid. I can be someone different tomorrow than I was last week. Uh, I'm not bound by or conditioned by any of these social expectations or my biological givenness or any of those things. And so the supreme value, if you will, in uh, postmodernity, although it's applied somewhat unevenly, is tolerance. I simply must accept others as they present themselves. You can see the tensions. You live with these tensions that this can cause every day. So what you judge is important is your own fulfillment. A couple more Kelvin and Hobbes. Uh, so what is objective truth? It says, okay, a true and false test that lasts some clarity. Every sentence is either pure, sweet truth or a vile, contemptible lie. One or the other, nothing in between. And then he flips the call. Answering the phone, hello, no, my dad's not here right now. Will I take a message? I don't know what's in it for me. People always assume you're some kind of altruist. An altruist is somebody who cares about other people. Okay, so I went into a um, classroom the other day at St. Catherine Drexel, and the second graders were learning the colors 
in Spanish. Some of you have heard this story that I'd like to story. And uh, so, gray in Spanish, anybody? Gris. So I said, what is this? And this little girl said, that's a bald spot. <laughs> she was, of course, correct. So as I go through very quickly this irresponsibly sweeping view of Western philosophy, there'll be a lot of bald spots. Why didn't you say this? What about that? Um, so this is really just a very um, U, uh, SR71 U2 level of overview uh, from 120,000 feet, maybe. So. The first recorded philosophical thought we have are called the pre-Socratics. They're asking about the world. What is it? Where do things come from? What does everything have in common? So the pre-Socratics, as they were known, Thales, Anaximenes, and Anaximander, Democritus, talked about what things are made of. Water? Is everything fire? Is everything earth? Um, or Democritus had a very ancient idea of atomic theory, that everything is made of these little balls of matter that are kind of clumped together and make the things that we see. Democritus was kind of a smart guy, of course. He didn't have the science that we knew. Uh, so they were trying to discover what makes up everything. But there was no proof of it. It was all conceptual uh, and it was kind of counterintuitive. We don't experience everything as fire, just in different rarefied forms. But they were trying to discover what underlies the things that we see. The Stoics, the Greek word stoa means porch. So they had this in their school, they had a porch and they would teach from the porch and thus they became known as the Stoics, the people who taught from the porch. That's not what we often think of with Stoics. The Stoic ideal was leaving behind those kind of abstract questions and asking, how should we live? The Stoics had the idea of a natural law. The ideal is to conform your life to the divinely revealed order of things without emotion, without passion. So the Stoic ideal was apathy. Not apathy like I don't care, but apathy free from emotion, free from passion, free from anger or impatience or um, frustration, all those emotions that sort of cloud us. The Stoics wanted you to live completely according to reason. The Epicureans, Epicurus was a, a Greek philosopher who said, that's not right. Your emotions are what make you human. Your emotions will lead you to truth. <coughs> Epicurus was not quite that crude because he thought the greatest, he had this sort of a schema of emotions. The greatest emotions were appreciation for admiration of objective truth, reason. So they argued with each other. Is it reason? Is it emotion? Aquinas will come along and say, they're both partly right and both partly wrong. If you have a life without any emotion or passion, you're not fully human. If I can watch somebody uh, be beaten and robbed, like the story of the guy on the road down to Jericho, and have no feelings about this, well, I'm just observing the... Uh, the number of blows that are being struck and the amount of blood that is flowing. I feel nothing by this. There's something inhuman about that. And Epicurus, well, it's true that emotions help us. They can also cloud us, cloud our judgment, cloud our thinking. We can become overwhelmed by emotion. So we wanted to find some middle ground. Socrates, we know from several other uh, contemporary writers, but almost everything we know about Socrates is from Plato. If you read Plato's dialogues, and there were, I don't remember what there were, 32 or 31 or whatever the number was, Socrates is his main figure. So scholars still argue about what did Socrates really say and what is really Plato saying, just putting it in Socrates' mouth. And how much did Plato edit Socrates? We don't know exactly. Um, 
what's originally Socrates. But Socrates was, so he inherited this world of the pre-Socratics and Stoics and the Epicureans, and it was just kind of this mishmash. Socrates asked the question, not what are things made out of or what do you like, but what is good? And what does it mean to be a good person? A person who seeks virtue, excellence, arete in Greek. And um, what does it mean to be a good citizen of the city state? He was an Athenian, the city of Athens. And if you know that story, um, you see here that picture is the death of Socrates. He was, he called himself the gadfly. So he kept pestering people with all these philosophical questions. I just want to watch TV, leave me alone. And uh, he was an annoyance and misled the youth of the city. And um, he would not simply offer sacrifice to the Athenian gods because he thought there was something deeper than that. And so he was executed. He was able to commit assisted suicide. I suppose you say he drank the hemlock, the poison. And, and he did it freely because he thought that that was the more noble, excellent, virtuous path to accept the judgment, even though it was wrong, of the city-state to which he belonged. Plato, Plato could go on for a long, 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 long time. The simple, the most important thing for our purposes to understand about Plato is that he thought that the really real was the world of ideas, forms, the ideal form. So there's a table, a table, a table. There's chair, 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 a chair in your living room. They have something in common, but they're all different. They're different materially because that chair is not that chair. They're different in form. Your easy chair is not the same as the one you're sitting on now, but we both recognize them as chairs. What lay underneath? all those commonalities. And he thought there's no physical reality that has that in common. It's the idea, the ideal, the perfect chair, which does not exist in this world. And the chairs that you sit in and stub your toe on and bump into confuse you rather than teach you about chairs, about chairness. And so, Plato had this ideal world of the forms. And your, your philosophical study felt like death, as it does at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. But that's good, because the body imprisons your soul, which is alone has access to the real world of forms. And so death, knowledge, philosophy is a preparation for death often seems that way as you sit here. And um, once you're finally freed from the body, then you can encounter and enter the real world of ideas, which we never fully, completely grasp here. So he had the very famous image in the Republic, his, his kind of presentation of what civil society should look like. Uh, in book six, I think it is, the allegory of the cave. And if you have any philosophy in your background, you've probably run across the allegory of the cave. He uses this image. So imagine this cave underground where there's no, just a very dim, diffused sunlight from behind you. And the prisoners in this cave, you see there are chained so that they can only face the wall. They can't turn their heads. They can't see the things around them or behind them. All they can see is the wall ahead of them. Behind them is a passageway with a fire behind that. And slaves carry these objects in front of the fire. And so all they see is an outline or a shadow of what this thing that the slaves are carrying is. An outline of a duck or a chair or a tree or a book or whatever it is. And they think that as they see these things repeatedly over and over, that's what reality is. That's what we're seeing projected here. That's the real. One of them escapes and is able to make his way out of the cave and go into the world. 
to see the sunlight, to see colors, to see things in 3D. And he's just overwhelmed by seeing the really real. What does this escaped person do? If he's a good philosopher, he goes back into the cave and tries to explain this to the rest of the prisoners who mock him, who make fun of him, who disbelieve him. And so for Plato, that's what philosophy is. I see the really real in the world of forms and I'm trying to explain it to you poor prisoners who think you know, but you really don't know. And so a philosopher always has a really rough life. That's the allegory of the cave. Aristotle, who is a, so Socrates taught Plato, Plato taught Aristotle. It's an incredible conflation of those three great Greek minds, one right after the other. Aristotle didn't like his teacher. Um, he thought that Plato has this just this abstract, bizarre kind of world that you'll never encounter, you'll never know for sure, that you just end up with more questions than answers. So Aristotle wanted to observe. He was really one of the first, what we would say, empirical scientists. He collected stories, he measured things, he experimented with things, he studied animals, the parts of animals, the parts of plants, he dug down in the ground for roots. Uh, he just was, uh, wanted to know as much as he could about the world around him. And then theorized about it. Aristotle prided himself on inventing logic. Well, he didn't really invent logic, of course. That's the way the human brain works. But he codified logic. How do we think through what we see? What that means. Um, what we see and how we come to know. Um, and so Aristotle's theory is often called, in part, hylomorphism, is one of those words on the quiz. It comes from the two Greek words, hyle, which means matter, and morphe, which means form. So that all things that we encounter in the world are made of matter and form. The matter is the stuff out of which a thing is made. The form is what makes it a particular kind of thing. So the simplest example, you can have a wooden chair, a wooden cup, a wooden table, uh, a wooden book cover, whatever you want to say. It's all the same stuff, but it takes a different form. And it's the form that makes it what it is. You have a, a stone statue of Plato, a stone statue of Apollo, a stone statue of um, Burger. It's all the same stone, but it's a different thing because of the form. This will sound familiar to you, of course, from theology, and this is where we get it through Aquinas from Aristotle. The form the sacraments use matter and form. It's, it's that, it's the origin of this. Aristotle also talked about, so what is it that lay underneath all of these things? You can have a large statue, a small statue. You can have a stone statue, a clay statue. You can have a uh, statue in Athens and one in Delphi. You can have a statue that's heavy, a statue that's light. The substance is what underlay all of those changes. The substance is what the thing in itself is, apart from all of those particular circumstances of the thing. The substance in the nine accidents always sounds like a band, maybe out of the 50s or something. Um, but they're, they're, they'll be listed in the handout uh, that I will give you. Uh, place, size, uh, habitus is equal to so what color something is, position, if it's in front or behind. All of those things can change about a thing without making it something else. This, of course, becomes important in sacramental theology for the Eucharist, where we say the substance of bread and wine change completely into the body and blood of Christ, but the accidents remain. So it looks like bread, tastes like bread, weighs like bread, science, all it will do under spectrography or chemical analysis, all you'll find is bread and wine. The accidents remain, but the substance changes, and only faith can reveal that to us. One of the things the philosophers argue about is being and becoming. 
is a thing the same thing it's the famous george washington's axe you know if you um, find george washington's axe but the head is rusty so you change the head then the handle breaks so you change the handle is it still the same axe what is being what is becoming uh, how do things come into existence how do they go out of existence so human life a human being comes into existence through conception grows in the womb grows throughout life uh, and then at the end dies coming into being and going out of being are substantial changes from nothing to something from something to nothing in between are all these accidental changes where i live what i do how i look what color my hair is if there's any left all of those things are accidental changes and so this is where you get into metaphysics where you say what underlies my physical uh, experimentation observation so mentioned logic he was a natural scientist we'll come back to the four causes in a little bit uh, and Aristotle wrote a great deal, as Plato did, about the soul. Famous work, De Anima, it's in three books, uh, where he looks at the soul and asks what kind of thing the soul is as the form of the body. What makes a body, all these chemicals and limbs and um, substance, come together into a person, an individual? It's the soul that makes a body alive. And he will say, and Aquinas will follow this, there's a vegetative soul in plants. Anima means soul. So an animal, we would call animals, all that means is soul or things. But he would say even plants have souls because they are alive, but it's a very crude and uh, low level soul. That soul does two things. It grows, takes in nutrition, and it reproduces, makes seeds so there's more, another generation of plants. Those are the two functions of a vegetative soul, to grow and to reproduce. Animal soul does something more. It has sensation. It experiences the world around it and can respond or react to that world. The lamb sees the wolf and runs away. The giraffe is hungry, goes after that tree. So they're able to interact with their environment in ways that plants don't say, you know, it's not very sunny here. I think I'll move over there. They don't do that without help. So uh, the, the animal soul has the vegetative functions. It also grows and reproduces but it also has sensation. The five exterior senses, touch, taste, smell, sight, hearing, but also four interior senses. Your dog has an imagination. Dogs dream. She's running in her sleep. You know, they're dreaming about something. Dogs have, um, he called it the estimative sense. I'm not sure what edition that newspaper is, but if my owner is coming like this, I'm in trouble. They don't reason that way, but they have experience. And so they learn that kind of reaction to experience. Um, they have a kind of an instinct. And so often the examples I use are spiders who can spin webs or birds that can find their way flying south. Uh, it's kind of an instinctual knowledge. And they have a common sense. Not the common sense like we say use your common sense but they can take different sensations the example of this is salt and sugar might look the same but when you taste them you know they're different so we combine two senses to come to knowledge humans have those two levels of being of soul according to aquinas but also have reason a rational soul and reason opens us up to the universal to truth as it is, to abstraction, to concepts and ideas, not like Plato's ideas, but uh, ideas in our minds. We can reason from one thing to another. And this opens us up to eternal life, to eternal truth and eternal life. 
only humans, Aquinas would say, have an immortal soul. So unlike the movies, not all dogs go to heaven, <laughs> according to Aquinas. Only beings with an immortal soul. So uh, Aristotle, we, in your spare time, you can read book three of De Anima, and he comes so close to talking about immortality. Basically, he asks the rhetorical question, how could this thing, which is open to universals in the abstract, not persist beyond the death of the body? He doesn't say it does, but he, he gets right to the threshold of asking that question. So around the time and after the time of uh, Aristotle, who was really just a remarkable mind, there were other thinkers who took looks at parts of this. Plotinus, Parmenides, uh, Heraclitus, Zeno, these were the questions about motion. Is motion real or is it an illusion? And how do we account for oneness and plurality? Which is more real? Is there really just one thing that appears in a variety of forms because of our limited understanding? Or are there many things that we make into a kind of a oneness just by our concepts? They wrestle with this idea. Zeno of Aelia, um, heard those Zeno's paradoxes, they're great. Uh, it's about motion. So the archer shoots the arrow. Does it ever hit the target? Well, no, it can't. Because before it goes that distance, it has to go half that distance, which takes time. Before it can go that half distance, it has to go half that distance, which takes time. Before that, and you get these smaller and smaller increments. And because all of it takes time, it's impossible for there be a, to be enough time for that arrow to hit the target. Well, sure enough, does. So how do we wrestle with those ideas? So Augustine. Augustine comes along and he's searching for truth. This is the uh, fourth century now. He's this deep searcher for truth. His mother uh, is Monica, who's a Christian. She has Augustine enrolled in the order of catechumens, but not baptized. Augustine had no time for his mother's Christian faith because it seems so simplistic, even a child could understand this. I read the Bible, this, this abstract knowledge of, of the greatest being of God should be almost impossible to understand, and a kid can know this. That can't possibly be the truth. So he falls in with the Manichaeans. We'll visit them again uh, as time goes on. The Manichaeans had the idea that the soul is good, only, and the body or any material thing is evil. There's this dualism, this dichotomy between the good soul and the body evil. And so the way you lived your life was to free souls from matter. How do you do this? By having banquets and eating a lot. You convert that the souls that are in that drinking a lot the souls that are trapped in that food and wine, I can liberate by eating them. Um, it was kind of a funny set of ideas. Um, and so you can see that Manichaeanism would die out. If you really believe the body is evil, you would never have sexual relations and there would be no more Manichaeans. So they were willing to make a few compromises here and there. Augustine was so taken with the Manichaeans, and one of the great teachers was visiting um, his, his town, and so he asked him the deepest questions in his mind, and the guy couldn't answer. And so he thought, well, Manichaeanism isn't it. And then he searched around in other ideas and philosophies, and uh, eventually, um, of course, he struggled with some personal things. Um, some a little bit with drink, but also a lot with uh, the sins of the flesh and lust. He had a um, uh, mistress, and his mother finally convinced him to get rid of that mistress, so he did, and got another one instead. Uh, and had an illegitimate son, a Deodatus, given by God, is what the name means. Uh, and he's struggling. He has some good friends who are trying to convince him, and he's really trying to control his... Um, 
personal weaknesses while searching for truth. And the story read in the Confessions, he is sitting in the garden asking, why can I not do what these people have done? Reading about the lives of the saints and the scriptures. He hears a child's voice saying, tole lege in Latin, which means take and read. So he picks up the Bible, which is lying by him, opens it up at random. Here is uh, Romans. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. All of a sudden. Well, not all of a sudden. It was all this long months and years of struggle that suddenly crystallized. And he's baptized, becomes a bishop, um, and still writes philosophy. But now it's illuminated by the light of his faith. He's known as the doctor of grace because he experienced firsthand that only God, not human reason, not any philosophy, could reach into his life and change him. So philosophically, Plato, uh, Aristotle is, sorry, Augustine is much more of a Platonist. They didn't know Aristotle. He didn't know Aristotle. So he's relying on Greek philosophy, Plato, the idea of forms. And he called them semines verbi, or seeds of the word, that all around you, if you trace and look deeper and deeper, you see signs of God's creative wisdom and love at work. Uh, and Augustine, because of his own experience, wrote a lot about and thought a lot about freedom, free will. How free are we really? And he understood that. So Plato had the idea that if you knew what was right, you would do it. It's sin, error, comes not from the will, but from a defective reason. You're missing something about the truth. Augustine understood, oh, there's something more going on than that. I can know exactly what's right and choose something else. And that's the definition of sin. So it's not a matter merely of the intellect. It's the will. And only God, by grace, can change our wills. That was Augustine's experience. Uh, I mentioned some Arabic philosophy of Arawis and Avicenna are two of the main figures. Those are Latin forms of their Islamic names, but they were the ones who translated Aristotle into Latin. And when Aquinas came across this, he found some errors in their interpretation of Aristotle. Because again, he was the commentator of Aristotle. He commented on the writings of Aristotle. He had the idea that there's only one intellect shared by all. Instead of each person having their own mind, these are all just pieces, participations in the one great mind, the unimind. And when you die, you become a part of this one intellect, which of course is going to be a problem for the immortality of the individual soul for Aquinas. Um, he also argued about the, uh, for the eternity of the universe. And this is a problem if you have a belief in creation, that things came out of nothing by the hand of God. He said the, the universe had always existed and always would. And also the idea that you could have more than one truth. The thing could be and not be at the same time. Wrap your mind around that. If you remember that song from maybe it was the 40s or 50s, it's got to be this or that. <laughs> it's kind of a natural understanding we have. If it's, if it's up, it can't be down. If it's right, it can't be left. There's just... Uh, Things exclude, opposites exclude one another. A very said, said, well, maybe not exactly. Something could be true in theology and false in philosophy and vice versa. This, of course, drove Aquinas crazy. You come then uh, into, so we often call them the Middle Ages or the, um, the Dark Ages after the fall of Roman civil, civilization and the in the West, Rome became a very tiny little town, about 30,000 people, and that great empire sort of moved to the East, Byzantium, um, and that's where it encountered uh, Islamic thought. And so sometimes they're called the Dark Ages, but they really weren't. There was a lot of learning and knowledge and uh, books and things preserved in the monasteries. Um, and we're learning handed on. Come to about the 10th 
11th century, Saint, there's a lot of people in between, of course, but Saint Anselm. Anselm was famous for um, his version of the proof of the existence of God, and here it is. God is that in which nothing greater can be thought. Wrap your mind around that for a minute. God is that in which nothing greater can be thought. So if you think about God, the, the greatest being, his final step basically says, if you can imagine this perfect, ideal, greatest being, it would be better if that being existed than if it didn't exist. And that was his demonstration of the existence of God. And philosophers have argued about this ever since. Is it just an idea or does it really prove the existence of God? People are still divided over that question. But it was a way to bring reason and thought into theological questions. Albert the Great was uh, German. He was, a, was uh, a scientist, really, much like Aristotle. And he was taken with Aristotle's writing, investigations, his scientific desire to know. And here you have Anselm in the uh, 12th century saying, we know much more now than they did about science. How can we take Aristotle's ideas even further? Albert was Aquinas' teacher. They were both Dominicans. Uh, and Albert, it was, who discovered in the dumb ox, as he was known, this kind of very quiet, shy, reserved guy, this deep well of knowledge and insight and intellect. And so Albert sort of brought Aquinas along. Come back to Aquinas. After Aquinas, well, contemporary to Aquinas, uh, were several Franciscans. So the Benedict, uh, you know, the Benedictines were this kind of established order with monasteries and place, and handed on a lot of Western culture and economics and this idea of a community life that is self-sustaining but also benefits the countryside around. The mendicant orders, the Franciscans and the Dominicans come as begging, which is what mendicant means. They go around, they don't have a place that they can call their own. They make their living off the kindness, the charity of the people around them, and in return, they preach the gospel to them. Um, the main difference is a lot of differences, of course, but one of the main philosophical differences between the Dominicans was you start with reason knowledge. The Franciscans, like Francis, the kind of poetic um, lover of nature and of nature's God, started more with love, the will. And so where Aquinas would say you can only love what you know, Franciscans say you can only know what you love. Both are true, of course, in their own ways. They're two different paths. And Bonaventure and Aquinas were friends, even though they were, they had some differences in their philosophical, theological outlooks, they were good friends. But it's that question of which has primacy, the will or the intellect, what I love or what I come to know. Bonaventure uh, was a pretty sharp guy. After him came John Dun Scotus. Scotus means he was Scottish, that's all that means. He was a Scottish Franciscan, who is also a very subtle philosopher. And he's also often called the Dr. Subtilis, the subtle doctor. Being taught by the Dominicans, I have certain reservations about Scotus. Uh, it was, if you remember the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on December 8th, we use his word, one of his great contributions to dogma, in the preface, prevenient grace. Aquinas couldn't quite understand how we could say that Mary was saved, preserved from original sin, living in time uh, before Jesus suffered and died and rose again. Scotus's answer to this was prevenient grace, that it goes before in time. This prevenient means ahead of or going ahead of. So that's where Scotus contributed to theology. But he also had this idea, he called it, and he spent a great deal of time on hiatus, 
thisness. So where Aquinas would talk about being and the different ways in which being manifests itself, Scotus wanted to take it a step further. How do, how do individual things come to be? Well, they have hiatus, and he kept sort of adding these concepts about things that just made it, instead of clear, more complicated. This is a Dominican view of the Franciscans, I will grant you. After Scotus, William of Ockham, another Franciscan, um, and the poor Clares don't like it when I say this because they're Franciscans as well, but I lay a lot of problems at the feet of Ockham. So, Ockham was the proposer of the theory that's sometimes called nominalism. From Latin, the word is nomen or name. Nomine is the um, ablative form. Nominalism means that there really is nothing in common in reality among all those chairs. We just give names to things. It's a convenience for us. There really is just this plurality of absolutely completely individual things, but our concepts, our limitations make us give certain names to them. Nominalism. This undermines a kind of a realism. So Aquinas was not a Platonist and say there's this world of forms, but he did believe that in the divine mind, there are certain things that are common that individuals manifest. So like human beings, we're all the same kind of thing. We're not all completely individual, separate uh, realities that have nothing in common. If you're gonna have natural law, you need a common nature to ground it. And if you don't have a common nature, then morality means nothing at all. So this is what, uh, why nominalism is important. Scotus looks a little shifty there, even in that picture, doesn't he? I don't think that's really what he looked like. But anyway, I found him on the internet. It's gotta be true. <laughs> so he's also often attributed with what he called, what came to be called Occam's razor. The idea that philosophy, and this is where I blame Scotus, had gotten too complicated, too many concepts, too many ideas, too many distinctions. You cut away with this Occam's razor, whatever you, doesn't really help you know. But you really got to know to use the razor well. Okay? And Occam didn't quite have that kind of intellectual apparatus, so the Dominicans would say. So nominalism became a problem. How do I know anything for certain now? If it's all just names and words, what happened to reality? This sets the stage for Descartes, the fly-watching mathematician. Okay. Uh, Cartesian thought. How do I get back to certitude? What can I know for sure, for certain? Where does my certitude lie? And so he did a series of thought experiments, the meditations, he called them, um, in which I go through and ask myself, I place myself in a position of doubt. One, I can doubt everything. I can doubt my senses because sometimes they're mistaken. I can doubt uh, the opinions of others because sometimes they have vested interests or they are mistaken or get bad information. I can doubt um, the measurements of science because sometimes they are disproved. What can I not doubt? Well, it comes down to the idea that I'm a doubting thing, that my mind doubts. So I think, therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. Even if I'm wrong, even if I'm completely mistaken, as long as I'm doubting, thinking, I must exist. And from there, he turns around and rebuilds the whole edifice. But you see what has happened here. It's often called the turn to the subject. I find certitude not in the world around me, but in my mind. And this has led to an endless series of problems which are with, with us today. If the really real, like Plato says, is more abstract, conceptual, 
and the world around me teaches me nothing about what is really real, if I can't trust my senses, then where do I turn? Inside, inward. And the problem, of course, is that everybody has their own mind, and sometimes more than one opinion or idea or concept, and it changes uh, over time. Well, another consequence of Descartes' method then, if I can trust my mind but not my body, you get this kind of dualism. What do you do with the body when your mind is the only thing that really matters? Well, the body is maybe just like Plato said, a prison, or maybe it's just something I have that I can manipulate at will. Um, maybe the body doesn't matter at all. Maybe the body is just a problem. This is the context, in part, for John Paul's theology of the body, as Wednesday audiences, to try and undo that kind of dualism. Catholic thought Aquinas would say uh, that we are a unity. We're a body-soul composite. You're not a soul that has a body. You're not a body that has a soul. You are a mind-body whole. Uh, and of course, his contributions to mathematics as well. We'll breeze quickly, okay? David Hume. Hume was an empiricist. Remember that word. If, uh, you observe the world around you, and that's why you know reality. But Hume was not a scientist. Hume just said, all that we really know for sure is our sensation. My experiences. Are they real? Do they lead you anywhere? I don't know. Even cause and effect. That's an illicit leap. Just because the sun rises in the east every day of my life, and every day on record that we have any record, doesn't mean they're necessarily related. It's just the kind of apparatus we have to bring to bring order to all these individual sensations. He's trying to react against Descartes' turn of the mind, but he did it in a clumsy way. Then you get Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant was a German. Uh, Kant was a really fascinating guy. Uh, if you have trouble falling asleep, I suggest pick up any paragraph of Kant and you'll be out in almost no time. Kant was a very methodical guy. And so there's the legend of uh, the philosopher's walk. Um, every day he would take a walk after lunch, the exact same route, the exact same time, so that people would set their clocks. If Kant's going by, it must be seven minutes after lunch. He was a very methodical thinker. Um, so what Kant, sometimes the, the image that captures the undergraduate's mind uh, in college is the apple sorter. So Kant said we have all these sensations and ideas um, and experiences, but our mind is configured only to know certain things, like the different size of apples. If they're too big for the apple sorter, they just won't go through. And so our mind is the limit to what we can know. He said there was the noumenon, the things in themselves, reality in itself, and the phenomena, what we experience. And so there was this noumenal real world that we'll never really have access to. Or even if we do, we don't know for sure if we do or not, because it's our mind that is that filter that only lets in certain kinds of ideas, knowledge, does this begin to unsettle you a little bit? So, uh, we mentioned modernity as that science becomes the criteria of truth, and Francis Bacon, scientist, who says the goal of science and technology is to relieve the human condition. So not only hunger and illness and um, you know the discomfort of of life, but even the problems in our relationships between uh, countries. Uh, nations, uh, that science it will give us the answer to all of these things. And I mentioned all these great scientific and geographic discoveries, which was broadening the European, where all these guys were, the European experience of the world. And things that always seem so certain now 
began to become more relativized. Maybe it's always been that way here, but it's not that way everywhere. Maybe human nature, if we all live in the same culture and have the same background, all looks the same. But we encounter these populations in other parts of the world that are very different than us, that have a different social structure, different ideas of right and wrong. Maybe there is no such thing as a common human nature. I like that little applet. Then you get to closer to our own day. Logical positivism was the idea that um, the only things that are true are things you can measure, verify, quantify. Anything else you just have to ignore. It doesn't really exist, or at least for any practical purposes. Mentioning linguistics, uh, philosophy turned more and more out, again, from the world itself to inward. How we use language what language means, where does it come from, how words can inform, deform, misinform, conform, all those different ways that language can communicate but also deceive. Phenomenology, um, so John Paul in the theology of the body is doing phenomenology. It was the idea rebelling against all this sort of turned inward to language and concept and limited knowledge to say the cry of phenomenology was back to the things themselves let's just look at the world again instead of reading books or how we use language or newspapers let's look at the world around us and if we peel away those layers of experience we'll get to the underlying truths dietrich von hildebrand edith stein who uh, became a carmelite nun and died in auschwitz as saint Teresa Benedicta of the Cross was a phenomenologist. She was a philosophy professor uh, and teacher and author under Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology. Nihilism, you get to folks like Nietzsche, existentialism like Sartre, um, that everything is absurd, none of it has any meaning. So Sartre used the myth of Sisyphus. Uh, the ancient Greek myth that Sisyphus had done something to offend the gods. His punishment was to roll this heavy stone up the mountain uh, before sunset. And every day he would just about make it, and then the sun would set the stone would fall back down. The next day he does it again and again and again and again and again and again unto eternity. And Sartre says, This is what human nature is like. We know it's pointless, absurd, but we just keep trying. Life makes no sense. Nietzsche, um, the Ebermensch, the idea that um, there is no meaning or purpose or pattern in life. It's the one who has the will to power, the one who refuses to be, to conform to expectations and the rules and the limits of society that will be the leader, the Ebermensch, the overman. Uh, Nietzsche committed suicide. He has a lot of psychological problems. Freud, uh, the um, father of psychoanalysis, he's sometimes called uh, Marx, Karl Marx, dialectical materialism, uh, and class warfare, and all those kinds of things. Ricoeur, Paul Ricoeur, was a French philosopher who called these three the masters of suspicion. And John Paul quotes this in the Theology of the Body. Why are they masters of suspicion? Because you can't trust human nature. There's nothing that is solid or believable. Um, and you come then to the postmoderns where knowledge is power and that there, you suspect that anyone who wants your allegiance has some ulterior motives. They're not trying to help you, they're trying to manipulate you. You're always on the lookout for what other people are trying to do to you. Um, the idea that Hobbes would have about Thomas Hobbes about human nature, which is where Calvin and Hobbes comes from, um, is that we are naturally competitive. We want to eliminate one another. Other people are a problem, an obstacle, and society only becomes because I need you, even though I hate you. I need you to do some things for me I can't do on my own, so we'll make this kind of social contract. I'll tolerate you as long as I need to, but we're naturally enemies. 
see the difference from the Christian worldview, that we are created in the image of God, that we naturally were social beings, we want to help and cooperate with one another, a very pessimistic worldview. All those other guys you can read on your own, Heidegger and Dasein and Derrida and Deconstruction. So we'll quit in just a moment, but back to Thomas. So you can see where Thomas can fit in all this series of theories, of ideas, of what humanity is, of what the purpose of human life is. Can we find some order, some purpose, some meaning? Um, relying on Aristotle was a risky thing because Aristotle was viewed as a pagan Greek who would uh, poison Christian thought. And so, Aquinas had to fight over and over for um, the, the validity, the value of using Greek philosophy. One of his saints, seldom affirm, never deny, always make distinction. And so you read Aquinas almost any question in the Summa and he will say, this can be understood in two ways. Or this can be understood in three ways. Or this can be understood in 12 ways. And he sort of unpacks these distinctions. Um, even when he disagrees with a philosopher or a writer, he will find some way to take their arguments seriously and show where it's partly true, but where it falls short. He's a very incisive thinker. Uh, and then in each question of Summa, as I mentioned last time, it has a, a uniform format. Videtorquod, it would seem that, so for example, for example, and we'll talk about this next time, the existence of God. Summa Theologia, the prima pars, question two, article three, does God exist? Videtorquod, it would seem that God does not exist. And then he gives a couple of reasons why not. Said contra s, however, then he gives a contrary argument. Maybe that's right. Then respondio, I answer that, and then he gives his logic. We'll talk about the five ways or the five uh, demonstrations he has of the existence of God using reason and observation. And then he answers each objection one by one. For three volumes like this, every single question. It's absolutely remarkable. Even if you don't agree with Aquinas, even if you find error in Aquinas, and he's not the magisterium. There are things that we would now say just aren't so. Uh, but it's an incredible, incredible accomplishment of consistency, reason, openness, and a kind of encyclopedic knowledge of the arguments of his time. So what are a couple of things that Aquinas, uh, we would now say he was mistaken of? One was his idea, um, he argued against immediate ensoulment. So when a um, child is conceived, when does the soul come into that body? Based on Aristotle's observations of chickens and fish, he would say the form has to be suited, the matter has to be suited to the form. And when you do embryology, you see, even in human embryology, these things don't look human at the very beginning and gradually you see this shape of a human body appear. So Aquinas said that the human soul is not induced until 40 days. Interestingly, when we're modern uh, embryology would tell us brain waves start around 36 to 40 days. And if your idea is that a rational soul is infused, it's a kind of an interesting uh, coincidence. But as I say, my argument was if Aquinas would have known what we know about the, the embryo, he would have argued for immediate and soul. I'd like to think so anyway. Uh, another thing Aquinas, uh, would say that we would say is not quite true. Uh, well, I mentioned the Immaculate Conception. Uh, he also had the idea, and this is based on Aristotle, don't be offended, but so um, women are kind of second class. Brainwaves start in men at 40 days and women at 80 days. It took longer. Um, so again, he's basing himself on 
what was known or not known about genetics, how human conception works. Um, it was a theory at the time, of course, that the, the being, the life was contained in the sperm and the woman is merely a receptacle for like an incubator for that life. Later, we know, of course, that egg and sperm both contribute 23 chromosomes. They knew nothing about that. So he's limited by the science that he had. Again, he's not the magisterium, um, but he was widely relied upon. Uh, so do your quiz, all right? Let's go back to the quiz. I'll have some handouts that answer these. We're almost done. Essence, which one is that? The essence? Letter E, what a thing is in itself is its essence. Related, of course, to a substance. The accidents then, as we mentioned, are Letter I, the incidental characteristics, color, size, place, weight, all of those things that can change without changing what kind of thing it is. The transcendentals, sounds like another band, maybe out of the 80s or something. Joe and the transcendentals. The one, the good, the true, the beautiful. They transcend any particular kind of category. Because you can have unity of thought, unity of uh, rocks, unity of trees, unity of, uh, there's mathematical truth, there's artistic truth, there's human truth, there's uh, genealogical truth, so on. Uh, natural law. G, a rational creature's participation in the eternal law of God. We'll talk more about Aquinas and natural law. Uh, he's often known as a natural law philosopher. But in fact, there's only really one question in that whole big thing that talks about natural law. It's much more about virtue. Uh, hylomorphism we talked about. It is the, where is it? C, composed of matter and form. Hylomorphic, matter form. The cause of a thing is the why. And we'll see that cause can have several different um, meanings. The material cause, what it's made out of, the formal cause, what kind of thing it is, the efficient cause, what makes it be, who makes it, and the final cause, the purpose, the end, the goal, the reason for something. All of them answer the question in one way or another, what is this? They're all causes. Virtue is, letter D, a stable inclination to be here. A virtue is a habit. We'll talk more about this as well. Um, so we have to think of virtue in terms of moral virtue, but there's also artistic virtue, mathematical virtue, mechanical virtue, where I have habits that work well in the particular thing I'm working on. We think of moral virtue, that's, as Socrates would say, this is what makes me a good person. Uh, nature, getting down to elimination. Nature is essence ordered to operation in Aquinas' and Aristotle's view. So the nature of something is kind of what it does. How do we know what a nature, the natural, what's natural to a thing, watching what it does. Habit is, a, uh, oh, did I get that wrong? Yeah, I did. So virtue is A, a habit tending to goodness. I'm sorry. And then habit in general is a stable inclination to be happy. I'm pretty sure I get up and make coffee and shave every morning, but it's such a habit that sometimes I have to stop and think, did I do that? Nope, I guess I forgot. And then act is the realization of a being. 
we'll come and talk later. Potency is the potential a thing has to be act as it's actually doing it. And you can see that for Aquinas, God is pure act. There's no potency in God. There's nothing that is waiting to happen for God. There's nothing incomplete about God. God is never a work in progress. God is pure act. And in fact, Aquinas defines God as tantum esse, only being, nothing else but everything, basically. Okay. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. You have a headache, maybe? <laughs> Last word, I'll just say this. So uh, authors will argue about these, this question. Is, can you really have a Christian philosophy? Does Christian faith sort of color how you think about things to the extent that there can be no really Christian reason, a reasoned approach to reality? Aquinas might ask the opposite question. Is it possible to have a non-Christian philosophy, something that does not presume the existence of a creator and final end purpose for all things. So that will be an argument that will continue. This is one of my favorite Calvin and Hobbes. He's pounding nails in the table. What are you doing at that coffee table? And he says, is this some sort of trick question or what? <laughs> Pretty obvious what I'm doing. It's not quite what she meant. So you can take these handouts. Uh, this is that list of philosophical terms and a few more that we'll get to when we get to the area of morality. I thank you for your patience. I promised you a painful experience and I think I have successfully delivered that. This really is just a very sweeping overview. And if it's confusing, I don't doubt that. Um, I had years of sitting in classrooms with really smart people, and I still don't get it completely. Uh, but it's just helpful, I think, to see sort of how one thing leads to another and how people are trying to react to an idea that came before them and think originally. And uh, I want to read you just a very quick quote. And this is Chesterton's biography of Aquinas. Now, this will make a little bit more sense to you. Since the modern world began in the 16th century, nobody's system of philosophy has really corresponded to everybody's sense of reality, to what, if left to themselves, common people would call common sense. Each started with a paradox, a particular point of view demanding the sacrifice of what they would call a sane point of view. That's the one thing common to Hobbes and Hegel to Kant and Bergson to Berkeley and William James. A man had to believe something that no, no normal man would believe if it were suddenly propounded to his simplicity, as that law is about right, or right is outside reason, or things are only as we think them, or everything is relative to a reality that is not there. The modern philosopher claims, like a sort of confidence man, that if we once will grant him this, the rest will be easy. He will straighten out the world if once he is allowed to give this one twist. So if you read some of these philosophers and say, that makes no sense, then you're exactly right. <laughs> Thank you. So next time we are not meeting. Uh, next week will be the Living Rosary at 7 p.m. So we will pray and St. Thomas would be happy uh, with that. Uh, and then we'll resume the following Sunday. Joe, did you wanna talk about where they can find some resources? We'll just make it. We don't have time to go on the website right now, but if you go on the website at Sacred Heart Soft Rapids and uh, you go to uh, Father Tom's uh, blog, <clears throat> there's a drop down there of these presentations. So uh, this video of this with the PowerPoints and his wonderful presentation will be recorded, and you can you can listen to it again. Again, again, again. We'll never get enough of it. <laughs> no, Wait till Lent. Every, every day I listen to it. I've almost got it. <laughs> Anyways, and then along with that, um, the, the handouts, I'm scanning and putting them on PDF so that uh, those who uh, maybe didn't get a handout last week, um, I do have some copies. The handout is available for you that just got here. Um, if you go to 
Uh, again, uh, go, to, go into the top menu. It's just a sign up Father Tom's um, blog, and then it's a drop down from there. Any questions? Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Does that mean November 22? I think we'll see how far we get, but probably we'll extend. Yeah. You're so patient. I think God will reward you greatly. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Is that I just hit off? Yeah. Yeah, you're good. Thanks for coming. Good morning. We have to stop the recording. Back up. Oh, no.